orchestration here because I want to have this haiku really mean something. You know who this is. You know who's coming up. All right. So again, ictus right in the middle. Right. We're all gonna clap together. Now watch the thing. Let's try one together. Here we go. Nice. Here we go. Magic beard of truth. Eyebrows raised. Perplexed yet sure. What else? Amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, James Randy. I'm going to have a word with uh, the people who arranged this program. <laughs> Having to follow Dan is no fun. <laughs> I can tell you that. So I have another announcement to make. That this, this will probably be a disappointment to most of the audience. And I, I regret having to make this announcement, but I will, I will not be doing my naked dance on fire tonight. <laughs> well, I, I know how disappointing that is, but uh, as a matter of fact, I've discovered that there's not as much call for it in the recent 20 years. <laughs> I was reminded that in recent times, uh, I had not delivered a formal address to this giddy audience. I stand before you prepared to make up for that lack of communication. Now, this keynote address will be somewhat different. What follows is a series of comments, confessions, and revelations. I'll try to explain to you the source of my assumed scientific expertise. I'll offer a few appeals to your kindness and some regrets that I have which may help to explain various inconsistencies in my behavior. That, you may agree, is quite a significant task. I'll begin by telling you that the very special pleasure I get in being here at a TAM gathering is that I really sincerely believe that I am standing before a substantial audience of very good friends. I trust that you look upon me as your friend as well. I've been very edifying, edified, pardon me, by exchanging opinions, ideas, and even arguments with so many of you folks. I hope that we have all grown somewhat as a result of that interaction. Folks, as one of my requests for the future, I'm going to ask you all to refrain from trying to add me onto systems that require a password, some sort of secret handshake, or yet another combination of digits and letters that I have to add to a huge list that is currently stuck to the side of my computer. <laughs> Though there is a Facebook presence for me on the internet, that is tended to by people who are adept at doing that sort of thing. I'm just never in that. I don't Twitter, flatter, or dither. <laughs> if I were to subscribe to any of these services, 24 hours would hardly be a sufficient period for me to fulfill a day's duties. I have a hard time enough responding to the nut mail that somehow manages to get through the built-in filters designed to spare me such involvement. My uh, personal medical condition has elicited a certain amount of interest in recent years, and to quickly bring you up to date, I'll merely give you a, a well, I'll say that in a few days after we close down this happy gathering, I'm due to be operated on. I have great confidence in the skill of the surgeons who will be probing this ancient frame. And if I appear to be rather stubborn about staying with you, just consider all of the medical procedures that I've undergone in recent years. It's true I've had to give up limbo, limbo dancing and pole vaulting, but I can still wash the dishes and perform simple tasks around the house, which reminds me of one of my claims to fame. I'm serious now. I just might be one of the best damn dishwashers in the world. <laughs> really. Now, I know that this statement requires evidence, and here it comes, and why I mention it. As a youth, on my own as I was from a very early age, I answered an advertisement looking for someone to work in a laboratory to wash chemical glassware. Sounds like a very humble occupation, but I got the job. I listened to instructions I was given. And I did such a good job that I was soon promoted. You see, I was at the Banking and Best Institute at the University of Toronto, or as we say, we're from Toronto, Toronto. I know a couple of folks here are from Toronto, and they 
edified me by saying they were from Toronto. The city in which I lived at that time, the, the lab's job was to test batches of insulin. At that time, extracted from cattle glands, and we used live rabbits to do so. Those animals lived very pampered and long lives, being selected only about once a week to have carefully measured doses of insulin, insulin injected under their skin, followed by determinations of how much their blood sugar had been thus decreased. I'll get into further descriptions of that procedure, which was <laughs> very humane and met my standards very easily. There was a typo there that would make you laugh. Yes, I graduated from dishwasher to lab technician, actually performing the titrations and writing up my reports. Ah, but Mr. Archambault, a wonderful name in my past, he was our lab director. He periodically did something which, uh, in my present position as a skeptic and one who interferes with the procedures of incompetent scientists whenever I can, he easily earned my admiration and served as an example for me. Mr. Archambault, Monsieur Archambault, pardon. He would periodically change a few figures on the lab charts that we had filled out and thereby produce results that could be puzzling to the rest of us. But we'd been directed to record the results that we found not the results that we might expect to have found. Quite seriously, ladies and gentlemen, I wish that such a standard were in place in labs all around the world so that reality might find a place in scientific work once more. I have been to so many of these labs even recently, and I find that they'll round off a figure here that, no, it shouldn't be that high. That is not science, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't even apply to washing laboratory glassware. This digression of mine was designed so that you might begin to see that my pretensions to scientific expertise, though learned the hard way, should at least be respected by those who denigrate them. The late Jacques Benvenis, who I, I rather liked, he fell head over heels for the spurious idea known as homeopathy. He often referred to me as a former test tube washer. He thought that would that would dump me all together, you know? Though I never resented it because I knew that I was a damn good test tube washer, <laughs> so there. I'll also mention here that our constant denunciation of the dangerous quackery known as homeopathy has proved to be one of the JRF's major expose and has served us and the skeptical community very well. I urge you to see the lengthy account that will appear in my 11th book, A Magician in the Laboratory soon to appear. We'll all buy a copy, won't we? <laughs> okay. I recently heard a comment to the effect that scientists are as easily fooled as others. Wrong. I say that they can be more easily fooled. I mean that. You see, scientists think in a straight line from A to B, from cause to effect. And those who would deceive them, the so-called psychics, think in curves. And no scientist would ever think, for example, that some small bug on a microscope slide or an asteroid in outer space would or could purposely set out to deceive him or her. Just doesn't happen in nature, but it does happen in the seance room or when small children find that they can be befuddle adults very easily by bending spoons when not observed. I am um, a great fan of a man named Spike Lee. I hope you're all familiar with Spike Lee. His motto is, do the right thing. And our theme this year is fighting the fakers. Folks, that's doing the right thing. And every one of us should be guided by that fine idea. I am constantly reminded of the grief, damage, and sorrow that is visited upon the innocent victims of the fakers. Now, I sat with family members who desperately tell me of how some elder of the family perhaps has squandered away the assets that supported them, and I've been helpless to advise them. They can't pay the mortgage and the loans. They can't handle the expenses incurred because some faith healer or quack has taken them to the cleaners, as they say. On another level, we learn of such persons as Sanal 
at a Marku, who spoke to us already about his government in India that literally drove him out of his home because he exposed one, the Catholic Church's fraud of a weeping statue that was poisoning people by delivering sewage water to them, a killer that made them rich. That's very shameful, ladies and gentlemen. Incidentally, Sanal, I, I, are you in the audience, Sanal? Okay. Thank you. You mentioned something about a bed of nails. I've got to tell you, uh, when I was, well, when I had left home and I was a, a, a young teenager, I joined a carnival, and there was a lady there. It was called the Lady with the Iron Feet. Now, she didn't have iron feet, folks. I, I, I'm lying to you if I would say that to you. But she did walk on a bed of nails, and she would lay down on a bed of nails. And um, I got interviewed by one of the local newspapers. I, I prepared a bed of nails for myself. It took me two days to put in something like 1,200 nails. Bang, 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 bang. Really, I have a huge bicep in this arm as a result of that. It lasted that long. But they were about half an inch apart. And I could easily lay down on that with no trouble at all. It was, it was rough, it was uncomfortable, I didn't like it much, but they were this close to one another. And uh, one of the newspaper reporters said, well, uh, they, they seem a little close, but uh, how would you suggest we test this lying on a bed of nails phenomenon that all the fakirs and the carnival people are claiming is supernatural? I said, well, and I think you'll approve of this, this is the beginning of my skeptical career, perhaps. I said, let's start with one nail. <laughs> and if they, if they can do that, two, then three, then four, yes. And uh, I, I think that the result would be very obvious. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this man, Sanal, is one of my personal heroes. And we're looking into what can be done to influence the government of India to right this wrong. And I hope that's done. Now, right in Plantation, Florida, where I presently make my home, there is a very expensive private school called the American Heritage School. And uh, on one occasion, some years back, I, I was asked if I would do one of my lectures there. And it was a public service. I was prepared to do it without any fee. Though, believe me, they had the money to pay if I'd asked for it. And uh, I went on the appointed morning and to the office of the, of the dean of the school. And uh, he greeted me, although somewhat strangely, he seemed a bit uneasy greeting me. And he ushered me into a room where there was a group of four parents, parents of the students at the school. And they seemed quite concerned. And uh, one lady spoke up and she said, uh, uh, we would like to ask you, uh, Mr. Andy, uh, during your lecture that you, you won't mention religion. <laughs> that didn't go down very well with me. And I said, we said, oh, I don't use it as part of my talk. But uh, if during the question and answer period, if I'm asked, I will certainly answer quite honestly. And they fidgeted about. They didn't care for that very much. Um, I ended up not doing that lecture. I had to walk out because uh, I was not going to be limited on answering a question about God or angels or whatever. I will not be limited that way. And thank you. I felt badly doing it, but I've had to do it on a couple of other occasions too. I'll spare you those accounts. To indicate to you just the sort of spectacular friends I have, oh, I'm, I'm so fortunate in this respect. I've walked in the shadow of Richard Dawkins for some time now and stayed at his home in Oxford. Wow. That, that meant if there were a god, I'd say it's Richard Dawkins. <laughs> I must tell you about a chap who's been a great supporter of the JRF. I won't name him because he's a very shy gentleman. Uh, he is very rich, let's put it plainly, very rich. And he um, 
heard about a book that had been discovered in a monastery near Grenoble in France. This was a monastery, one of these strange places where you had to get into it on a sort of a cage box with a donkey pulling the other end of the rope and it would haul you up and you'd get off at the other end, hopefully alive. And uh, it had been known by scholars for quite some time. It was a hymn book, a hymn book about so big like that and about so thick. And uh, there's quite a, a recorded history of this and you should look it up. That hymn book was a palimpsest. How many here, let's see, show of hands, how many know what a palimpsest is? Gee, not very many. It's a thing you get on your neck right here. No, no, I, I lied, I lied. No, a uh, palimpsest is a reused book. Now, I have to explain that. When books were done handwritten before the invention of printing, uh, parchment was the most common substance on which these pages were written. And parchment is very expensive, of course. It's either goat or, or cow skin or whatever, depending on the grade you need. And um, a palimpsest is a document which has been scrubbed with brushes and such and water and washed clean from the, the former writing that was on there. And this hymn book that was in there, beautifully illustrated, or as they say in the trade, illuminated with gold foil and beautiful miniature figures and such of various biblical heroes. And uh, some people had noticed that in the gutter of the book, when you open the book, that strip down the center there where the pages come together, that's called the gutter. And they had noticed that there were some handwriting, or not handwriting, pardon me, writing, instead of going this way across the pages, it was going this way. It was very faint, it was washed out essentially, but it was very faintly visible. And some of those scholars over the past 100 years or so, because it was known for quite some time, studied that writing and uh, made a translation. It turned out to be Greek. And uh, they studied it so carefully that when they put together various sections of it, it occurred to somebody, wow, this is Greek and different kinds of Greek in different uh, states or provinces of Gr Greece at that time. It was quite different, the writing, and the, even the use of the words was somewhat different. Like each little city-state had their own way of doing it. And they determined, they knew where it originated, and uh, so they were able to do some translations of it. It turned out, to these scholars' surprise, that this seemed to be scraps of something written by Archimedes, the very famous Greek philosopher. Now, it had been rumored that Archimedes had turned out a book called Mechanics, and it had never been found. No one had ever had a copy of it. Turned out that this was a copy, erased, mind you, of the book Mechanics. Well, my wealthy friend heard about this, and he made a bid on it. He ended up, I believe, paying something like $1.6 million to obtain it. And uh, he brought it into the United States. He gave it to the Walters Museum in Baltimore. And they specialize in restoring palimpsests, particularly. The problem was that there was not much ink there. You know, it was soaked into the, into the parchment, but there wasn't much there. But then they discovered a wonderful fact. Those who are technically minded might cheer along with me when I announce this discovery. It turns out that the hymn book was written with lamp black ink. That is, lamp black mixed with gum Arabic, and it's very jet black and it's cheap and easy to make, but that hadn't been discovered when this was written. Now, the, the writing was not from Archimedes' hand himself. No, it was a copy of the Greek version of his book, The Mechanics. And, um, Carbon black is very dense, very intense, the whole thing, and so is gold leaf and a few things like that. They were part of the book. But the ink in which the original image had been written of the Archimedes text was made with oak galls. Now, oak galls, this is all technical stuff, but just go over your head. Don't bother about it, it's not just peripheral. 
they're little parasites, little puffballs that grow in oak trees. They don't hurt the oak tree at all. And uh, they produce, however, they're the only natural source known, I believe, of tannic acid, an organic acid, which has a peculiar quality that if you dissolve it in water and you mix it with a soluble iron salt, it turns jet black, it makes excellent ink. And that has been used for a long time. But the one quality about this ink is that is the lost image in the palimpsest. It had iron in it. And so my wealthy friend came up with a wonderful idea of making an MRI machine. Not my size, no, just this size. Just big enough to hold a page of the book at a time. And when they put those pages in there and they scanned them for the iron, all the other writing vanished. The machine couldn't see that stuff at all. But the entire old writing that was embedded in the parchment was perfectly visible. They recovered everything but two pages of Archimedes' wonderful book that had been lost for all those years. What a victory of technology. Now, um, the interesting thing, uh, for those of you who are mathematically minded, I, I, I won't trouble you with all this stuff. But for example, one of the things they found out about Archimedes, he was much more of a genius than anyone had ever suspected. This got into Time magazine and was on the NBC News one night several years ago. Uh, Archimedes actually knew about four different degrees of Aleph. Now, briefly, there are four different degrees known of, of infinity. Infinity, that's all the way. Well, hey, there can't be two infinities. Oh, yes, there can. Try this on for an intellectual puzzle. Aleph 1 is the number of possible dots, which have no dimension, just position, you see. Dots on an infinite plane that goes out to infinity in all directions. That's a big number. That's an awful lot of dots. More dots than you'll ever use or even conceive of. OK, that's an in infinite number of dots. That's Aleph 1. But think about this, and I let it roll around in your head, and you'll see that this is a larger degree of infinity. The number of possible straight lines that can be drawn on that same infinite plane, going in all directions. And it, of course, they can vary in length. They can vary uh, the direction, so you've got so another order of infinity. And the third order of infinity, uh, I, I should let you find this out for yourself, but I won't. I'll take mercy on you. It's a number of curved lines that can be made on the same plane. I'll look for you don't want to know about it, believe me. But this is a wonderful discovery. It was thought that it was only discovered back in the 1920s and actually codified that Aleph 1, 2, 3, and 4 existed. Archimedes knew about it. And the discovery of this palimpsest is therefore a major discovery in science. And I celebrate the fact that this gentleman gave this to the museum, the Walters Museum, and had them sketch it, scan it, do the whole thing. And I have in my library at home two books, literally this size and that thick, one on top of the other. It's the whole reproduction of every page in that palimpsest. Wonderful work. What, what a scientific achievement. Leaves a lot of people totally cold, but by golly, it excites me because I'm curious that way. So that's the accomplishment of the palimpsest. I thought I'd share that with you. Now, another thing happened to this same gentleman. This is a, a sad and a happy story at the same time. Do you, do you remember Sue? Sue was the the most complete T-Rex, Tyrannosaurus Rex, uh, skeleton ever found. And uh, she was found someplace, off in a wild place someplace, and brought in to the United States and went up on auction. <laughs> My friend, the wealthy friend, he decided to bid for it for a reason that, that he had in mind. And uh, he sent his agent to to England, to uh, the, the gallery there, and they started to auction it off, and he listened in by phone. And he told them they could go, I think his limit was 1.2 million or something, and he said, stop at that point, and give it up. Well, some people 
offered $500 and a few things like that. And uh, it soon all came down to two bidders, he and an unknown bidder, him and the unknown bidder, him. And, and the price went up and up and up into the millions. He had given up, as I said, I think at one, two million, and it stopped. The next person that got it, person or organization that got it, obviously had a, had a great find on their hands. Then he found out that the next day, this is the sad part of the story, the people who actually got it were the Field Museum in Chicago. He was intending to buy it to give it to them. <laughs> well, they, they had a few laughs over that on the telephone. I think he had tears in his eyes while he was laughing. But that's the kind of guys I knew. I mean, the people that I have gotten to know, I'm so fort fortunate to, to know them and to have them think highly of me in many cases. Now, earlier I enjoyed a talk by uh, Barbara Drescher concerning the Mensa organization. I'd like to address that subject for a moment, if I may. Back in the 60s, I did a radio program on WOR radio, AM and FM, in New York. And uh, that covered all the United States and part of Canada, and even got down to New Mexico. It was a 100,000 watt transmitter on AM. Wow. And uh, I got the attention of the Mensa people. I had a few of them in as guests. It went from midnight till 5 in the morning. And uh, the Mensa people were always entertaining, and they were smart. Oh, yeah, sure, they were smart. And we had good discussions. And, but they kept on saying, come and join Mensa. Come and join Mensa. I said, no, I haven't got that time for this sort of thing. And uh, yeah, 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 come. So they finally talked me into it. And one Saturday afternoon, I went in to take the test. <laughs> and uh, that was pretty funny, because they sat us in a schoolroom. And we had a piece of paper that was all filled out and printed. Turn your papers over and start answering questions. And some of the questions that were on there, well, the thing was written in the UK. And two of the questions involved pounds, shillings, and pence. Well, the people in the room knew nothing about that, but I had lived in England for quite some time by then, and uh, I could convert the, the currency very easily. And I just walked through that in a breeze, you see. And when I finally got to hand the paper, and I said to the examiner, I said, oh, this question shouldn't have been on there. Oh, we, fail, we, we should have crossed that off. But so many other people had wasted their time on doing that. In any case, I was accepted into Mensa, and I was invited to give them a talk. I did give them a talk in a crowded auditorium a week or so after that. And uh, I brought up the subject of astrology as, uh, what, how did I define it now? Oh, yes, bullshit. <laughs> and uh, I immediately had a bad reaction from their audience, because they had SIGs, that's uh, studying interest groups or something like that. I forgot what it stood for. And I got it. A lengthy argument from a gentleman who waved his fist at me. We know astrology works. It's an ancient art, and it's been practiced for millions of years or whatever. And he gave me an argument. I simply, no, the, the, the pin of a, a Mensaite is a yellow map pin with a little receiver on the back of it. And I had it in my lapel proudly. And as I stood at the podium there and I heard him talking, I just simply took the pin out and stuck it into the podium and walked off stage. What satisfaction that gave me. <laughs> Now, I must mention something here, folks, that um, there's a friend of mine in the audience here named Bob Gretwin. He's a professional nurse and uh, very skilled in the art of nursing. And his wife is, too, I seem to recall. So it's a nursing family. And uh, Bob Gretwin um, asked me to make a mention to this, and I certainly will. The uh, biggest nursing association in this country and around the world has declared that uh, a thing called therapeutic touch, which isn't therapeutic and it doesn't involve touching, so it's badly named, I would suspect, uh, actually works and that their members can do it. It means you wave your hands over the human body and you can feel their aura. Duh. What was the word again? Oh, bullshit, yes. <laughs> I keep forgetting it. Now, we challenged Bob and the JRF, we challenged the, the people to come here to CHAM and be tested for this. 
and they would also be eligible for the JRF's billion dollar prize, you see. And they hummed and hawed, and they carried on for quite some time, and finally they just refused to answer us, and Bob was very disappointed. That, but Bob wants me to announce that it will be done next year, and what we will do at that point is probably announce maybe the, the cessation of the Nursing Association altogether, but certainly of therapeutic touch. That won't exist as something that's, that's uh, evidently to them something is genuine. Can you imagine? What a crazy claim. Now, I must briefly introduce you to just a few old friends and associates who are with us today. Just a very few. There are so many. First, I want you to meet a young chap who I met some months ago in India. I was lecturing there, and it was my very first visit to the continent. He'd made a very long trip from his home to where I was attending the THINK conference, T-H-I-N-K, an event which I believe is offering serious competition to the famous TED meetings that have been receiving such merited attention, and of which I was a guest a couple of years ago. This young man's name is A.J. Apadat. Are you there, A.J.? Where are you? He's got to be here someplace. Right there, all right. Stand up and wave at the people. Okay. Now, I must tell you, this young man, I was on one side of India, he simply showed up suddenly in the lobby of the hotel where I was staying from the other side of India after a torturous trip across the continent uh, just to share some of his thoughts with me. We headed off immediately and he decided to attend his first TAM meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, you've met AJ now. He'll be seen pushing me around in a wheelchair. And I hope you'll take the opportunity, please, of saying hello to him and shake his hand. Thank you. A gentleman you uh, oh thank you. Get ready. <laughs> a gentleman you've seen at every TAM, usually scurrying about to perform one of the numerous requests we make of him, is Scott Romanowski. He's a good friend of mine. He just visited my home. He's visited my home many times. And I really don't think that a TAM can take place without Scott. He's a valued friend and colleague, so please stop him and express your thanks to him. He's at one, one of the tables out there. He'll be identified by his badge. Please say hello to Scott and tell him that you appreciate his work. <laughs> and Chip Denman is one of our executive board members. Uh, is, is Chip in the audience? Uh, maybe, maybe not. But uh, you, oh, there you go. All right. So a round of applause for Chip Denman. He's done a wonderful job for us all these years. Please. And uh, Barbara Mervine is in the audience. That's Kitty Mervine. And she has writ recently written a children's book that explains to them some things about mythology and mistakes that adults have made. And the kids probably love that idea, I suspect. Barbara, are you out there? Oh, she's here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Barbara Mervine. <laughs> and he better be here. The one and only Jamie Ian Swiss, fearless prestidigitator. Are you with us this evening? <laughs> All right. You know who he is, of course. You've seen him. And uh, I'm very honored to say that the perennial Tamar Richard Saunders has arrived from Australia to share news with us, and you've heard from him, and I hope that you appreciate his efforts. He's been a great supporter. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, uh, a small number that I can mention of, my, of our good friends, the JRF good friends, of course, is the one and only Michael Shermer. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> and of course, all you folks know our JRF president, DJ Grothy, and his partner, Thomas Donnelly. Thomas has been aboard the JRF for years now and has quietly contributed to our success. Let's hear a good round of applause for that guy. As I say, these are only a few of our all-time stars at the JRF, and this particular meeting has been a grand, grand success, and I thank you all for coming. But I, I must tell you a bit of a, an anecdote here. On the wall of my office in Fort Lauderdale, I have a photograph of that gracious First Lady, Betty Ford, assisting me at a 1975 Christmas party at the White House. I was invited to perform there. I was very honored to do so, of course. 
I'd been invited there to entertain the children of the diplomats. Uh, I, I must tell you of a, of a funny, well, I think funny, uh, episode that happened at that time. I, uh, I entered the blue room where I was to perform, and I was setting up my props and everything, and I saw Betty Ford come in, accompanied by a couple of Secret Service agents, as you might suspect, and uh, seeing her, I immediately, boldly, made my way over to the First Lady and addressed her. And a Secret Service man stepped in between me and the First Lady, and she sort of just pushed him aside a bit, and uh, she said, Sir, can I do something for you? And I said, yes, ma'am. My name is James Randy. I'm the amazing Randy. I'm entertaining the children. I was dressed as a magician, you see, and she rather suspected that anyway, I'm sure. And uh, she said, what can I do for you? And I reached in my pocket. I took out a small red silk handkerchief I had. And I said, ma'am, I, I have to ask someone in the audience that they have a small handkerchief. Would you be kind enough to carry this for me? And when I asked for a handkerchief, would you give it to me? And the Secret Service man lit up and he said, the First Lady does not participate in shows. <laughs> she put her arm in front of him. I remember his name was Lloyd, poor chap. <laughs> and she said, Lloyd, I'll take this. <laughs> took the handkerchief from me, stuck it in her belt. She looked Lloyd straight in the eye and she said, Mr. Randy, I'll be proud to wear your colors. <laughs> That was a lady. Oh, yeah. And at that same uh, White House visit, I ran into a fellow named Robert Orban. You wouldn't know who Robert Orban is, but any magicians in the audience will certainly know who Robert Orban is. Yes. There you go. Thank you, sir. Whoever you are. <laughs> Robert Orban uh, was an actor and a magician. Uh, is still, still alive. In fact, he's one year older than I am. Can you believe that? That's a magic trick in itself, you see. Um, an actor, a magician, and a writer uh, of, of gag lines. He used to write for various comedians, and he wrote several little booklets for magicians with funny stories in them. Uh, he was working at the Ford White House, so I couldn't help but ask him. He said, I said, does Jerry Ford use many of your jokes? And he said, well, yes, he tries, but uh, I wrote him one, for example, take my wife, please. And that's an old line, but Jerry Ford decided only to use part of it. He said, take my wife. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> and uh, so it didn't go over very well. There weren't too many huzzahs in the crowd. Now, uh, I, I, I even remember, I gotta get into it, I even remember a routine that <laughs> that I took from one of Robert Orban's books. Uh, yes, I used to say to my audience, oh, this is awful and corny. I was born at a very early age in a log cabin I helped my father build. <laughs> we were a very poor family. We couldn't afford to have kids, so the people next door had me. <laughs> I left home at a very early age uh, because of something my father said to me. He said, get up. <laughs> I won't go any further, that's it. <laughs> But it was a longer routine than that, and it was just as bad all the way through, I can assure you. As that great artist, Frank Sinatra, so often sang, regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. Well, I'll list a few of mine. Though I had an occasional opportunity to do so, I never personally witnessed a live performance by Luciano Pavarotti. What a regret that is. I visited South Africa twice, too, and I tried hard to get to meet Nelson Mandela, but I never managed that either. And I rather hope that things will improve in the nation of Egypt so that I may someday stand before the Great Pyramid. What a wonderful thing. I can't wait to have that opportunity. Now, you've heard from DJ Grothy, of course, several times here at, uh, at this TAM, our esteemed president, with details on the state of the JOF. DJ tries so valiantly to keep me on the straight and narrow, but I often stray. I'll just say, read the origin of the JRF, that I was one of the three founders of the Committee for Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal, known as PSYCOP. Thank you. I undertook to meet with Martin Gardner and Ray Hyman to, uh, for a few, to discuss the possibility of launching such an organization some 37 years ago, wow. 
Well, Psychop flourished under Dr. Paul Kurtz, as we all know. And uh, at one point, I was, this was quite a shock to me, I was specifically ordered by the executive of Psychop to avoid ever mentioning Uri Geller again because Psychop feared him, though I didn't. I knew that he was, at that time, our most important target. He no longer is. We don't hear of him at all now. Interestingly enough, however, Geller was forced to pay a huge sum of money to Psychop when he grandly lo lost the case, the legal case, that resulted. I didn't get any of that, but Psychop got something like, I think it was $240,000 from, from Geller. So that was a loser for him. The JRF came out against Reverend Peter Popoff, as you all know, I'm sure. And with the help of the Johnny Carson Show, we won that fight decisively. Oh, yeah. We fought Sylvia Brown effectively. We battled with psychic John Edward. We've opposed quack medicine. And I assure you that my 11th book, remember that title, The Magician in the Laboratory, yes, okay. <laughs> will expose even more of Brown's chicanery with details, I assure you. So it was 25 years ago when I first came up with the idea that eventually resulted in the JRAF. It was launched to continue the skeptical fight, no holds barred. At that time, I had no idea that I would ever be standing before such an audience of skeptical friends and colleagues. I'm justly proud of what we've done. I'm mindful of the contributions that you've all made towards perpetuating our work, and it's quite evident that this organization, ladies and gentlemen, is now the leader in the field of rational skepticism worldwide. No other agency has achieved what we have. In a time of serious economic difficulties, we have survived and flourished. We've attracted followers of all ages, many nationalities and ethnic sources, a wide range of professions and every sort of philosophy. Folks, if a guy could bust from pride, I'd have done it by now. I must tell you of the event that beautifully illustrates how skepticism has been an integral part of my long life. I've never been able to discount what at first seems to be a fanciful story ever since my paternal grandfather, who was very close to me, told me how his own father learned to respect such tales. As an only child at age 12, Gramps, uh, George Zwingi was his name, moved with his family from Austria to Copenhagen, Denmark, and they became Danish citizens. They took up residence on a street that bordered the large park that still holds the Royal Palace of Denmark. And George's dad worked at the Royal Shipyards, that industry being a major activity of the country, as it still is. Now, the family arose at a very early hour every weekday, so that my great-granddad, I trust you're following the family relationship here, could get off, work, off to work, pardon me, by dawn with his lunch, without, pardon me, without his lunch, which his wife would lovingly prepare and give to young George, who was commissioned to deliver it to the shipyard on his way to school. Thus, his morning routine led him first to the shipyards and thence to school, for which he was never late. But perhaps from being an only child or due to his shy nature or the rather limited acquaintances he had as a recent immigrant struggling with a new language, little George seemed to have developed an imaginary companion about whom he would constantly regale the family every evening. He would tell them of Mr. Christian, a huge man with a black moustache, riding a huge black horse surrounded by men drawing, uh, bearing drawn swords, and monstrous dogs that were larger than George himself, but very friendly. Mr. Christian, he said, would regularly ask him about his family, even offering hints on how to treat colds and other minor afflictions from which his mother suffered. Having been proudly told by George that his father worked as a shipwright, Mr. Christian, he told them, even suggested that Mr. Zwingi might want to ask to be transferred to a new area of the expanding factory. Now, that last suggestion from a ghost that this young boy was imagining in his mind, that last suggestion from the ghost was too much for George's dad, who sat him down and read him the new rules. Though they'd been tolerant of tall stories before, 
there was to be no more mention of Mr. Christian, giant dogs, black horses, nor men with bared swords. This imaginary situation was officially forbidden to come up again, and despite the, go the boy's urgent exclamations, the subject was permanently closed. Well, a year or so later, as Mr. Swinger opened his evening newspaper, young George's eyes widened as he saw the front page. Father, that's Mr. Christian, he exclaimed. He pointed to a full front page birthday portrait of His Majesty by God's grace, King Christian the Ninth of Denmark with his Russian wolfhounds and his personal bodyguards astride his huge black horse during his usual early morning ride around the palace, the very monarch with whom George Zwingi had been exchanging pleasantry, pleasantries as he made his way through the royal courtyard shortcut every morning on his way to the shipyards. <laughs> How joyously my granddad loved to tell that story of vindication of how his father's attitude about children's stories had rather changed. Many years later, on one of my many visits to Copenhagen with my friend Klaus Larsen, he kindly walked me through the very same path that my gramps had taken some 120 years before. Thank you, Klaus. In the interest of time and of your patience, I'll close this by simply saying that I am enormously flattered I mean this, folks, right from the bottom of my heart, by your attendance here at TAM, and my staff and colleagues I know share my feelings in this respect. Next only to the well-being of my partner in life, there is nothing more important to me than the continuance of the JRAP. Ladies and gentlemen, newcomers or old friends, thank you for being here, and I hope that we can satisfy your needs for further knowledge related to what we believe is our very important work, bringing a better understanding of reality to the populace of this beautiful blue planet. Simply by being here, ladies and gentlemen, you have aided us hugely in achieving that goal. Thank you. Thank you. James Randy, ladies and gentlemen.